Hi, welcome back to Frankly Wines in the time of Corona. It's Thursday. Uh, this is now May 8th. There we go. Seven. I think we're all losing track of time these days. Um, it's Thursday, so we're going to be doing drinking in the now. And, uh, you know, so far we've been covering some seasonal things, some rosés. Uh, last week we did orange wines. But um, the reality is over the spring, as these containers have been arriving, we have been getting access to some of the fun, awesome treats that we only really get small little drips and drabs of in the spring. And um, I'm not happy about restaurants being in their current situation, but the reality is we've been offered things that we would normally have not gotten, or we've been offered more of items um, that we previously would have only gotten a sh small quantity of. Um, so, we're here in the store, kind of like kids in a candy store, looking at all these shiny, fun new bottles coming in, and not all of them go online. In fact, most of these bottles don't go online. The ones that we're talking about today, we have pushed online, but there's definitely some other more exciting things to talk about. And so tonight we're gonna do a special rare wine of it edition of uh, Drink It In The Now. And I decided to pop bottles that were, again, a little bit more approachable, nothing crazy, but we're gonna get started with the Domaine Palpio, his Bourgogne Chardonnay, 2018. Now, I love Italy, but if there's really one wine category that I, if asked what I feel like drinking, I'm almost always gonna say white burgundy because I just, think it's so mesmerizing and entrancing. And so a domain like Paul Pio has been around, um, I think they're on their fourth generation. They were started in 1900, yeah. And so originally it was started by Jean Baptiste. Um, his two sons took over the domain after World War I. And Henri, one of those sons, his son was Paul, who took over in 1968. Um, both Paul and his father, and uh, uncle were able to pick up some really, really great uh, crews, especially in Chassagne Montrachet. So even this Bourgogne Blanc is actually 40% of the fruit is from Chassagne Montrachet, and the rest is from a very, very uh, rocky site in Romigny. So um, currently, uh, Paul's son, Thierry, has been running the estate since 2004. Now, Thierry has uh, started to bottle some wines also on his own. We've also had his Bourgogne uh, Blanc. And, but Thierry has really put his focus back into the vineyards, into the farming practices, and to pulling back the oak a little bit. So he tries to keep just about 10% new oak on wines. Now, I think with a grape like Chardonnay, you have a lot of people who always assume that oak means it's gonna be coated in butter. But you have to realize these wines in Burgundy kind of need oak to tame them a bit because they're so mineral driven and just bright and racy that they kind of need a little oak to mellow them out a little bit. A lot of people like to use neutral oak so that it doesn't impart the oak flavors, but it allows the um, wine to breathe a little bit because oak is a porous uh, structure versus a stainless steel tank, which is not gonna breathe, there's gonna be no oxygen. Concrete allows a little bit of oxygen, but even still, your most porous uh, way to age a wine is gonna be in an oak barrel. So, oak is not a bad thing. Here, however, you'll notice he's just got it down to like 10%. Now, oof, it's a little reductive, but that's what I love. That like striped match, flinty, flinty mineral that's on top of this beautiful, like soft lemon curd. This is on the shelf for 42. Um, mm, super silky as well, just, I don't know. I mean, for me, I know you should have food with it, but I almost don't even wanna ever put food with white burgundy because I don't want any other flavors to fight with it in my palate. I just, it's so eye-opening and racy and lovely and fun. So anyways, they do uh, farm organically and sustainably um, and even after all those extra buys, they're up to only about 13 hectares, and four and a half of them are red wine. So, hey, you want a white burgundy that's still under $50? I absolutely forget, suggest the 2018 Paul Pio. All right, on to my next one. 
So this is an American wine. These are the wines from Michael Cruz. And so it's Cruz Wine Company. He makes such little wine that I have not had a lot of opportunity. Um, we'll be offered, you know, six bottles of something and I'll sell them. Um, and here and there I got op had opportunities to, to taste things, but everything's always good. So usually whatever we take, we'll just take it. We got a whole case of this Petnat um, Valdige this year. So I decided what the hell, we're freaking popping a bottle and we're having it. So again, so uh, Michael Cruz kind of got dragged into wine because he was into science and um, it seemed like the perfect segue into it. And he kind of came up in the Napa Valley uh, working in a few different cellars. And then eventually finally he decided to start his own thing in I want to say what year was that? I can tell you. Anyways, he is preferred, even though he's in Napa Valley, he tries not to work with the obvious, you know, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir. He likes to, uh, Cabernet, obviously being Napa, he likes to do different and unique grapes. So he'll work with things like Valdigay, he'll work with Tanat, he's worked with, um, let's see, other, he does work with, he does do a Chardonnay as well. However, he, um, yeah, he just kind of like does fun, different stuff. So as a pet nat, you can see it's got this really, really pretty, beautiful color. It's a little bit deeper. Technically, when he makes this wine, which by the way, he only makes 265 cases of, a total of 3,500 bottles. He does whole cluster press, and then on the side, he macerates a little bit of the Valdigay, which a lot of people have called Napa Gamay. So it's usually a light, bright red. Um, he adds a little bit of still macerated red into it before the fermentation. He does the fermentation in steel tanks. Since it's pet nat, he bottles it while it's still fermenting. So while it still has gas trapped in it, he bottles it then he then does riddle and disgorge. So sometimes with pet nats, you have to worry that there still is the kind of yeast deposit, the lees are still in the bottle and you end up with a little bit of gunk, shall we say, but not here. This is super, super clean and it is awesome. I gotta say, it's so good. Oh my God, it's like wild strawberries and like somebody like was toasting rosemary and like herbs. Mm. Now, technically they say it's a little higher on the carbonation, but it's soft enough in the palate. It, it doesn't strike me as being incredibly carbonated. It just strikes me as being incredibly delicious. Um, it has a hint of the natural feel, but he does use a bit of SO2 at bottling, which I always prefer. But um, I want to like eat a roast pig with some rosemary with this. I could chug this whole bottle on my own. It's honestly uh, one of the more savory and interesting rosés I've sparkling rosés I should say I've had in a while so great job Michael Cruz I understand why your wines are so allocated all right now we're gonna go jump back to France so this is going to be a pulsard from Domaine Montblanche so this is in the Jura the Jura is the valley just east of um, Burgundy they do grow some Pinot Noir as well, but then they have two local gro grapes, main local grapes. One is Pulsard, which we're tasting. The other one is Trousseau. You may have seen them. They're still usually light red varietals. Um, there is a little bit more wild, savory gaminess to the Pulsard. Not gonna lie, when I first popped it, it was a little awkward, it needed a second, but it's really coming to a beautiful place now. Now these, um, again here we have a husband and wife team. They only started in 06. They do everything totally organically. Um, and they, even though they have 10 hectares that are split up, some of their vines are over a hundred years old. So they, they swept up some solid um, vineyards. And so this is 100% Pulsard. They do a whole bunch of fermentation and they do that in stainless steel tanks. Don't touch it at all. And then after two weeks, they put it into, again, old barrels to let it rest and age for a bit. But yeah, it's got like a grilled meat and kind of mushroom thing that's over the top of like this very kind of roasted red berry note. I mean, you can tell it's a very light red, um, but it's got so much savoriness to it. It really kind of wants meat. Like I wanna have like duck or like 
roast chicken or quail or some sort of game bird with this. Like, it has a savoriness that makes you want that. So, again, um, uh, they do, uh, I wish, what was their total production? Ah, I wish, I thought we had that note down. Anyways, not a ton of wine though. Again, total, total 10 hectares. We also have their Cremant, which is their sparkling white from really, really old vine Chardonnay. Hmm. Delish. All right. So now I'm going to take a moment to just point out a few things. I'm not popping these, but pointing out a few things that are also very special. While we're still in France, I'm going to pull in a couple things from Domaine Rouleau. So we do have their Aligote in stock right now. Um, I do have a couple bottles left of the uh, Bourbon Blanc and I do have the Merceau Duchet. Those are not online, so you're gonna have to reach out to us if you would like to know anything about those. The Aligote though is always fun. Again, a little reductive, salty, apricot, flinty red fruit, totally a steal, $45. And then we also have their uh, Montelly Rouge. So Montelly is kind of, um, it's a, in the very southern part of the Cote de Bonne or the Cote d'Or, um, kind of near Volnay. Uh, Montelly's tend to be a little bit more punchy. I'll be completely honest, did not taste this bottling because I only got a case. So that's all, but hey, if you love Rouleau, which who the fuck doesn't love Rouleau, you can definitely give that one a whirl too. That's 89. Now we do have, we got uh, back to jumping to Italy here. So this is some Ariana Occhi Pinti. This is her um, Vino di Contrada. We got a six pack, which was a mix. There's technically three different Contradas, which are their uh, very high altitude crews. Um, there's two bottles of each. I think we might have sold a bottle so far. However, these are 95. These are special uh, bottlings that she did very minuscule amounts of where she just felt that the vineyard was so special that she didn't want to blend it. The grape is Frappato in all of these. Frappato is a very, very light aromatic red. Um, you only really find it at the very southern tip of Sicily near Vittoria and Acate where they are. Um, but you know, Ariana is the niece of Giusto Occhipinti of Cos, who has historically really been somebody who brought a lot of attention to the area. And she also is hard set, organic, biodynamic, and really, really listens to the land. These wines are always gorgeous. I was really excited to be offered that six pack because we've never even been offered that before. All right, now the thing I know everyone was getting excited about, Lopez de Heredia, yes. We do still have a bit of the 2010 Gran Reserva Rosado. So this is gonna be Garnacha mainly with some Tempranillo and just a little drop of Viura. Viura is the white grape of Rioja. The Vigna Gravogna is 100% Viura. Now, Lopez de Heredia has been around for over 130 years. They're in Rioja Alta. They are pretty much as old school as it gets. They, um, apparently to control the temperature of fermentation, they just open the windows. That is literally as technological as it is. You would think it was still like, you know, 150 years ago. Um, but, uh, their Rosado, they don't only release in great years. People go crazy for it. It is a very, in both of these, they let it age four years before they, uh, four years in the barrel. Then they did uh, a little quick fine egg whites, held it in a bottle a little bit before they released. These are like savory, sometimes slightly oxidative style wines. You obviously get more red fruit in the Rosado. Um, the Gravogna is, so yummy and delicious with things like a roast chicken um, or like a big paella, I imagine, since it's Spain, if you were gonna do something, but you can have something hearty with this white. And you can actually all absolutely have something hearty with the red too. Um, I tasted the 09 a couple times. I didn't even taste the 10. I wish I could tell you, but there has been so much interest for this guy. So it's online. It's max one bottle per person, but there's a few left. All right, before I fully sign off, I do just want to bring this little guy over here because this is definitely the most exciting thing I've ever been offered and there is more than just the bottle in front of me. Um, Didier Dagno, we've got a couple vintages of Silex as well as the Persan and the Blanc de Fumé. Some is sold, there still remains a little. I just want to make sure you guys know it's here, but we're definitely not putting those online. You're going to have to hit us up. So. 
We look forward to hearing from you and arrivederci.